Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to uh, Affiliate Summit. Good to be in New York. How many of you, if I may ask, this is your first time to a summit? Wonderful. How many of you are brand new, would you say, to affiliate marketing? Okay, so great. So we're going to have some fun today. I'm going to take you through some of the uh, traffic building strategies that we use. We're going to talk about the industry players. We'll talk about tips on choosing profitable topics. We'll, we'll dig in deep. We've been uh, in the business, and when I say we, my wife and I have been full-time affiliate marketers since 1999 when we kind of carefully stumbled upon this and figured this looked like a pretty good opportunity to uh, change from one business that we were in at the time to another. And having a look back at it, uh, and even this industry, I, I'd like to take a look at, uh, we have a, in the industry out in the, in the business world today, you see a lot of graphs that look exactly the opposite, you know, uh, the opposite of that. Whereas with the Affiliate Summit, and I've had a chance to attend just about all of them, it's nice to see an industry that seems to be growing year after year. This is the Affiliate Summit West that uh, has been held in Vegas for the last, I guess, what, seven years, since 2005? And then you take a look at the East Coast, same type of graph. So it's nice to be involved in an industry that's growing year after year. So there's uh, some uh, opportunities here for us that are looking for a business. So it's nice to be in, a, in, a, in an industry that's going up instead of down like so many. Like I said, got started way back in 99, and you can tell by the size of the computer monitor on the screen there. And there's our, our little family there, and the only one that's missing is Justin, who's taking the photo. And that uh, computer monitor is so heavy, I could barely lift it. But uh, it's a special picture to me because we were in a business prior to this, a little telecom company that we owned that was struggling along, and we finally... Uh, discovered the affiliate marketing industry and things started to go real well for us. So it's kind of a fun picture and uh, you know we look back at that quite often because it was a pretty much of a struggle. And what, uh, what really turned it for us was our very first check, which was from a company out of California called Address.com. And uh, it was very odd for us at the time because we were living in the Fraser Valley, which is about 40 minutes out of Vancouver up in British Columbia. And we received a check from a company I'd never met anybody who worked at. And we were marketing a product from, uh, from uh, you know, their banner ads, their, their text ads, their display ads. And we were putting them on our sites. And all of a sudden, they send us a check. And all of a sudden, you get this check in the mailbox, you realize maybe this is real. And I was even to the point I was wondering if it was even going to cash. And sure enough, of course, it cashed. But uh, that kind of proved the industry to us. We ended up moving out to the coast. And it really changed everything for us. We managed to survive through the uh, dot-com crash, uh, and then we kicked off our very first affiliate marketing training uh, about 11 years ago, back in 2001, in a little office uh, about 20 minutes out of Vancouver called New Westminster, where we uh, used to bring uh, friends and family and anybody who was interested in learning how to make money with affiliate programs into our office, and we'd show them how to get started. Wrote the Affiliate Marketer's Handbook back in 2002, revised it a few times over the years, Host the uh, Affiliate Buzz podcast on Webmaster Radio since 2003. And uh, we've been speaking at major events. And one of my uh, favorite things to be able to say is we finally put the dream car in the garage back in 2004, 2005. And we hold various boot camps and, uh, and things. So it's been just an amazing industry for us. It's been an amazing business. And it's been something that uh, we enjoy getting up to, uh, to work on every single day. One of the things that I know sometimes we struggle with is who's who in the zoo, as you know, as we say. Who's, who are the industry players? Well, we've got the advertisers, and then we've got all this crazy lingo. We've got advertisers, and we've got merchants. And what's the difference between an advertiser and a merchant? Nothing, really. The advertiser is simply the person that sells something. And this is an example of Bluehost.com. Of course, they sell hosting. And as an affiliate, we can join the Bluehost affiliate program, and they will pay us between $60 and $90 for every subscriber that we send to them. Of course, we've got consumer goods as well, which is an area that I like to focus in on a lot, hard goods, the goods and services that people buy every single day. This would be the Land of Nod, another merchant that sells various uh, products. Then there's, of course, the affiliates, also known as publishers. And we are the ones that drive the traffic to the merchant sites or to the advertisers. So a good example of an affiliate site would be themaparty.com where they specialize in themed parties. And then if you go in and read through the site and you're looking to put on a little Spider-Man uh, birthday party for your little guy, you'll find the whole set there. And he's, they don't actually sell the products. Of course, they refer them to a company or a merchant that does. 
Same with a site like uh, Yogurt Flavored Life. Uh, they've got a series of products and services that they refer their visitors to. So you've got the uh, merchants, you've got the affiliates, and then we've got the affiliate networks where we've got companies such as ShareASale.com who will be hosting the, uh, the major party tonight. If you've never been to the Under the Stars party, you have to go. It's amazing. And the uh, spoils run every single year. But the merchant or the affiliate, sorry, the affiliate network is the third party resource that sits in between the relationship between the advertiser and the, the publisher or the merchant and the affiliate. And these are the ones that provide the third party tracking and infrastructure that makes a, a lot of this uh, tick. This is where we'll find our banner ads, our creatives. This is where we'll find literally thousands of programs to choose from. And share sales is just one affiliate network of many. You've got Commission Junction, you've got LinkShare, you've got a whole variety of them to choose from. Then we've got a new player on the scene in the last uh, few years called the agencies, or also known as OPMs. And you'll hear there's a lot of, like, like any industry, a lot of three-letter acronyms. And OPM is simply a, a three-letter acronym for Outsource Program Manager. So they're an affiliate manager that works for themselves on behalf of a company. So they're the, the merchant would have outsourced their affiliate management or the, the management of their affiliate program to an agency. And there's quite a number of these in the industry now. You've got Jeb Com uh, Commerce with uh, Jamie. You've got uh, Karen and uh, Joel over GTO Management. You've got Brooke Schaff from Schaff Consulting or Schaff Partner Centric now. And there's quite a number of these. And the nice thing about the agencies is they'll go to bat for us, the affiliates. So they're also, in addition to having an affiliate network who's handling the technology and the, the payment of the checks to us, in the relationship between the advertiser and the affiliate. You've also got the agencies that are working on behalf of the merchant, but they're also working for the, uh, the affiliates as well, or us affiliates. So it really works out nice. And then of course, without the customers, none of this would matter. So the customers are probably the most important one in the entire mix. So those are the, the five industry players. There's basically seven affiliate models to choose from. How many of you already have sites or started to put together a website? There's a, there's a number of ways to go with it. Of course, there's the coupon sites, and uh, many have done very well, kind of falling out of favor a little bit these days, primarily because they're very difficult to get ranked in Google, because they're usually typically very thin on content. But there are some very popular, very profitable couponing sites out there. Typical example would be freeshipping.org. And you know you can do Google search for a product that you happen to be looking for, Bluehost, Bluehost coupon code. That would be, you'd find a site like this that'd be offering up discount codes to purchase products and services of all kinds. Shopping comparison sites would be another model where it's literally that. It compares the products, one product against another, gives you the differences between the two, makes it easier for you to decide which product you want to purchase. And then you've got one of my favorites is the niche review sites, which is basically just a site that reviews products, typically one page at a time. So you have a page of uh, content where they'll review a typical product. And as you can see there, we've got uh, a link off to a page where they review the Blendtec uh, Total Blender. And then there's another one with the signature series there. And it links through to a product or a review page or a product review page where they'll review that particular product. Loyalty sites where companies like Fat Wallet, where you'll get a discount or a, a rebate for shopping through them. Of course, there's email lists. How many of you are building an email list currently or have heard that you need to build an email list? That's a, ma a major strategy in the affiliate marketing industry, some, one that I have been engaged in for years and highly recommend paying very much attention to it. But essentially, it's building a list, building an audience of people coming back over and over again to, uh, to your site through your email list. You get to know them. Podcasting sites is one that's not generally talked about too often and something that I start to see a little more upcoming. Uh, this is my wife's site, epilepsymoms.com, and she has a podcast on this site. And podcasting is interesting because sometimes people won't do podcasting for a variety of reasons. One, they're scared of it. They think, I can't do that. Uh, but also, they, they don't want to get into a regular rhythm of doing a podcast every week or every two weeks because there's a lot of commitment to doing it. Meanwhile, it's one of the most powerful ways to get your message out into the marketplace and it can differentiate you over your competitors almost instantly because pretty much they're probably not doing it. So in her particular case, uh, she put together a little podcast and that's our son up in the corner there. He was, uh, if you read the tagline, it says when he was four years old, he was having two to three hundred seizures a day and literally they told us to put him in a crash helmet and institutionalize him. It was a horrible mess. 
But Arlene worked with them for years to get, a, get it straightened out to the point where he graduated. And it was a real success story. So she put a, a website together about this story. And that's the nice thing about podcasting. It really makes it easy for you to be able to share your story. And her little podcast there, she's done six episodes, and it's been downloaded over 80,000 times, and it's available on many, many sites around the internet. And they're really easy to spread because there's all kinds of podcast directories that will take your RSS feed, which I'll talk about shortly. And every time the podcast is updated, all of those websites update automatically. So you don't have to do any extra work, but you can really push your message out into the, uh, out into the world quite easily. And then one of my absolute favorites is the hybrid affiliate site. And this is uh, an associate of mine, Don Campbell, from expandtoweb.com. And this is kind of a blend of a lot of what we just talked about, where you're, you're doing multiple different things within the, uh, within the different types or different models. Where in this particular case, Don's got a very successful podcast. And if you're interested in learning about tips and tools using WordPress and various uh, ideas on getting traffic uh, to your website. Great podcast. It's free. You can go have a listen to uh, Don's uh, podcast. But he also has videos that, he's, uh, that he has on the website that he markets through YouTube, or sorry, promotes through YouTube. He's got uh, a small business theme that he's created, so he's got his own digital product. You're starting to see a lot of affiliates these days. In addition to promoting products and services for the merchants, Many of us have, are also creating our own products that uh, complement the, uh, the products that we're, that we're recommending. So a very powerful way to go is to kind of take a few of these ideas, not all of them, you don't need to use them all, but if you blend a few of them together, you can really uh, see some success. And I'll give you some tips on that shortly. One of my favorite types of sites is the simple little niche review site, and I thought this was kind of a clever site because of course, you can't use the word Ferrari, and this is a uh, website that sells or promotes products for Ferrari.com. They've got all kinds of watches and goodies for Ferrari lovers. And, but of course, you cannot put the word Ferrari in the domain name because you'll probably get a nice little letter from their legal department saying cease and desist. But Ferrari's first name happened to be Enzo. So Enzo Lifestyle was a pretty clever way to go. And on this site, what uh, Michael does here is he reviews various products that are available over on the Ferrari site. So you can see they've got the watches, they've got the, uh, the Ferrari baby buggy, and who wouldn't want to have one of those if you're a little kid? The Ferrari tricycle, you've got the uh, sunglasses, and so on. So what they do is they review those types of products and those types of services on the website, and then of course there's a link off to the merchant, and if somebody comes to the site, clicks through on the link, heads over to the mer merchant, makes a purchase, then they get paid a commission. How many of you have struggled with trying to determine which product you want to you want to market? It's always a struggle to figure it out because you're going to spend a lot of time, even if it's just to review one product properly. It takes you a fair bit of time to really go through and and, and dig it dig it apart. So some tips that uh, we've come up with over the years. Number one, one of the things that I look at is what's the price point on it. If the cost of the product is twelve dollars and you're making ten percent, that's a dollar twenty per sale that you're earning. Take you a long time to earn some real money. But if you get up into a, an area that's $150, $200, $300 or more, every time you make a, a, a sale, you're going to make a lot more money. So the, one of the determining factors I look at is how much does it cost? Number two is, is it a well-known brand? Because if it's already a trusted, well-known brand, it gives you a big leg up over trying to uh, promote a product that nobody's ever heard of. So I always have a good look at is, does, do people know this brand? The other thing I look at is, is there any positive reviews on this, on the website that's selling it? In this particular case, this is from Amazon, and this is a big mistake affiliates make. They'll go out and review a product, then they'll send the visitor to a, to a website such as Amazon, where all the reviews of the products are horrible. I'd never buy this product again, this is the worst decision I ever made, and then they wonder why it doesn't convert, because these reviews are very powerful. So what, what I like to do is find products that have great reviews. So if you can find a product on a website like Amazon or many, many others, where they're listing the happy campers or the happy customers that are using the product, it just makes your job so much easier, because when the, when the visitor lands there and they've got a, a product that's a decent price point, is a well-known brand and everybody else is saying thumbs up to it, then it makes your job a lot easier. Also, a well-known merchant. 
merchants such as Amazon, you're not going to get any pushback from potential purchasers of the product who are wondering, you know, is my credit card safe with these guys? Am I going to get a refund if I ask for one? So if you can find reputable brand, reputable brands to uh, represent as well, that'll help you a lot. And then, of course, is anybody looking for the product? Because there's a lot of products out there that may have a very low search volume. So I always like to go have a quick look to see if people are actually looking for that product. How many different keywords do we have to, uh, to look at? And you can see in this particular case, and sorry, it's very small there, but uh, for the Bose uh, Wave Radio, all kinds of search volume there that we can dig into. There's a little bit larger there. And then number six, competition. How competitive is it? And the nice thing about affiliate marketing, it's okay to have competition. Uh, I stay away from the really heavy, heavily uh, you know, competitive topics such as credit cards and some of the major financial services, insurance, those types of uh, industries because I find that it's just too competitive. It's not necessary when there's so many other industries that are a little bit more midstream, a little more consumer products that'll make it a lot easier for you to compete. Top five web development strategies, use WordPress. How many of you use WordPress now? How many give it a thumbs up? I think it's the best thing that ever happened to this industry and the, and the internet in general. I don't know how many tens of millions of websites are built on it now, but uh, if you're looking for a content management system to build your website and you're wondering uh, which, which CMS, as they call it, content management system you should use, this would probably just save you a whole bunch of time, just go with WordPress, you'll be 100% fine. Number two is build pages, not websites. Google doesn't rank web pages. Somebody will come to me and says, well, my site's not ranking. Well, Google doesn't rank websites. Google ranks web pages. Every single page on your website will get an individual ranking by Google. People can only look at one page at a time. So really focus in on building pages, not sites. Number three is avoid clutter at all costs. The beautiful thing about WordPress and these types of content management systems, it makes it very easy to fill up your columns. The bad thing about WordPress and these types of content management systems, it makes it really easy to fill up your columns. So you wanna make sure you avoid clutter at all costs. People lose a tremendous amount of money because they fill up their, their columns with clutter. You'll see a lot of the big bloggers will have websites that's just a snowstorm of banner ads and two or three columns sometimes that are just full of stuff. If they would ever measure that, they would quickly see that they're losing a, a small for, uh, fortune because clutter really does uh, distract your visitor from it, taking the action you want them to, to take. So I always like to determine what exactly do I want the visitor to do when they land on the page and then try to get rid of as much as the other stuff that would take them away from doing that as possible. Tip number four is add you to the site. People don't want to buy from an anonymous website. They want to know who is behind the site. So if you can get your smiling face up in the header graphic, and I get so much pushback from this, put it up in the header graph. It'll, it'll, you'll be amazed what it'll do for your site. Set yourself up in a, a nice about us page. This happens to be uh, Jane Warren from Tobal Tubes Direct. And, She's actually, she uses her product. They've got a, a beautiful home over in the Grand Caymans. They live in Florida. And uh, that's her with her girlfriends out on the towable tube. So instant credibility if you actually have the product in your hand and you're using it. So anytime you get an opportunity to, uh, to get your face on the, uh, on the uh, website, do it. Where else, can you put your, where else can you put you on the website? You can put yourself, your name should go with every blog post. Too many people post admin. You look at the little admin, it says posted by admin. Nobody wants to buy from admin. Or it'll say a guest post. I like to make sure we got people's names. Get their little gravatar up there, their little photo, their little image with, their, with the article that they wrote, and the article that you wrote, so that people know who they're dealing with. It'll make a big difference in your business. And then tip number five is automatic updates. I was just uh, chatting actually with Don Campbell and he says if it's not automated, we, we, we treat it as if it's, if it's not set up. Because if it's not automated, it, uh, as he said, it typically doesn't get done and it, he, he's right in that area. What you're seeing there is a simple little uh, email alert. Anytime I post a podcast on my website, anybody who's subscribed automatically receives a little email from me that looks like that. I don't have to touch it. All I have to do is make sure that the podcast was added to the website 
using a little feature that I'll show you how to use uh, shortly here. But uh, automate as much as you can. Top five free traffic building strategies. Number one is the Google natural search results. Still by far my favorite. And one challenge you're going to have, you're going to hear a lot of noise about all kinds of traffic building strategies that you can dig into. To me, the first one that I'd recommend you start with is Google natural search because they still have a monstrous amount of traffic. And of course, once you've obtained your listings, uh, you've got the opportunity to sit there for years. We've got rankings in industries that we've had for years. And that traffic, unlike the right-hand column where the advertisers are paying per click or the little grayed out area across the top, once you have your listing in the natural results, as long as you don't make a mistake and do something crazy, uh, you can probably hold that position for quite some time. And of course, you don't have to pay for that traffic. Number two is press releases. And a lot of people miss this one. And this is a big one. This is a big strategy because it can really separate you again from your competitors. And press releases are kind of a sleeper. And I'll tell you a little story. When my wife was launching her podcast, she didn't have any traffic because the site was brand new. So she was looking at ways to, to build an audience. And she wanted to interview one of the doctors that was very instrumental in us getting our son back on track. And she decided, although she was terrified to do it, to contact him and see if he'd agree to doing an interview over a, a conference line, kind of like a webinar or a, uh, a conference line, not a webinar, but over the phone. And he agreed, and she decided to go ahead with it, but she had no, nobody to, to invite. So I encouraged her to put a little press release together. We hired somebody over at Elance to put a little, this little press release together. We used a service called PR Web to, uh, to distribute it online. And that did very well. She had room for 125 people in the room, or in, on the call, and that filled up about half of it. But she still needed to, she wanted to fill it up. So we took that same press release, and I says, why don't you print it and put it in an envelope? Let's go old snail mail, old school like we used to do, and get the envelopes out there. She took the press release, she took some clippings, she put a little letter to the editor together, and then she stuffed it in those little brown manila envelopes and went over to the mailbox and mailed about 50 of them. And within a couple of days, she had a call from the local newspaper who said, hey, we want to come out and do a story. And they sent out a reporter, and they sent out a, a, a photographer, and they sat with her for a couple hours, took her over to a local little train place where they could take uh, pictures of Adam in kind of his environment. And then uh, that was the result of it. It was a full page. Cost her $50 for the postage and probably, you know, 25, 30 bucks for the rest of the, the, uh, the envelopes and, and that type of thing. And it resulted in the front page, the full front page, and then the inside as you see it there. Filled up the rest of her call, Where's just like that. Pardon me? Where did she send them to? The local newspapers, local radio stations. And, and the nice thing about getting into one, they have a tendency to you know, to, to, to go over to other communities as well, which it did. And there's the whole front page and there's Adam there. Traffic building strategy number three is podcasting. And podcast, I've been podcasting since 2003. We have the longest and oldest running podcast in the affiliate marketing industry. And we've literally been doing it for nine years and it used to be twice a month on the 15th and the first of each month consistently. We never missed the show, we were never late. A couple years ago, we moved it over to uh, Webmaster Radio, and it's weekly now. And the beautiful thing about podcasting is every time you release a show, that email goes out automatically. Guess what everybody does? Comes back to the website to get the podcast. And if you're sending them out every week, you got an opportunity to bring your list, your audience back to you all the time. And it's no pitch. It's just a nice way to get, to get to engage them. And you can do this in any industry. It doesn't matter what industry you're in. I've seen great podcasts on fly fishing. I've seen mommycast.com, which is amazing. And it's a really good way to bring people back. And they really have a tendency to get to know you because they hear your voice. If you have a little guest that you want to bring on. And how many have the knee-jerk reaction right off the bat to say, hey, I can't podcast? Anybody? Because I know when I talked to Arlene about it, I says, I can't do that. I can't, I'm no, there's no way I can do that. I'm petrified. But she did it, and it worked out real well. Geekcast.fm, this is uh, Sean and Missy's site, another place that you can post your podcast. 
And again, a lot of these sites will update automatically every time you post your show on your site. If you go out and submit your RSS feed, which is very simple, real simple syndication, literally you drop your, your code onto their website. Every time you update your podcast, your podcast will update over however many podcast directories you have your feed tied into. So in my particular case, I have about 25 of them. So every week, every time I drop the new show on the site, automatically, 25 websites updates, and each one of those websites has an audience of their own as well. So seriously considering podcasting as a, a method for uh, bringing in traffic. And of course, there's this little site called iTunes that is uh, just amazing, and they can subscribe via iTunes as well. If you want to do podcasting, there's a, a WordPress plugin called Blueberry PowerPress. And Blueberry is spelled without any of the uh, E's. So B-L-U-B-R-R-Y. Blueberry PowerPress podcasting plugin. And it's free, and it's amazing. Sean uses it, uses it. I've been using it for years. And uh, easy to install, easy to use. You can see there it is there. Traffic building strategy number four is build an email list, or again, I like to call it an audience, because really it's an audience. You're, you're, you want to build an audience for your site and for what you're talking about, what you're sharing. So it's important that you do a good job on it, and you want to come up with, we call it an opt-in offer, something that's really compelling to give to someone in order to subscribe to your list. And this is something that needs to be taken really seriously. Sometimes it just somebody wants to just quickly throw something together. And to me, that's not the way. You have to really sit down and plan to spend some time brainstorming and thinking through what exactly is my audience interested in and what can I put together for them that would make them uh, uh, really want to subscribe and stay engaged with us. So uh, putting together an email list with an opt-in offer is something that's very, very uh, compelling. Number five is YouTube. This is a crazy great way to build traffic. And there's a picture of... Uh, the Cobra there, and you can see right there, 35,000 visits. There's another one there, 29,000. There's another one, 284,000. If you look at these today, you'll see they're all up another 50, 60,000, some of them. And they just seem to be growing and growing. Just like you see the Affiliate Summit traffic pattern going up, same with on YouTube. We see this all the time where people put together nice little videos, and they take the time to actually add a great headline and they write a nice description with them and they, they make sure they fill out the little form. If you're going to add a video to YouTube, that little form that Google gives you to figure out that so many people don't fill out is the reason they don't see any traffic. If you just take the time to fill out the paperwork when you submit your video, you'll be amazed at how much traffic you'll get to it. And then of course you can see right below that there's a little link there. You can also include a link directly back to your website so that when they're finished watching the video, they can click on the little link and come right back to your site. Traffic building strategy number six is Twitter. And I know enough about Twitter to be dangerous, and that's about all. But uh, if you get a chance, write this name down. Stephanie Lichtenstein. And it's L-I-C-H-T-E-N-S-T-E-N. T-E-I-N, Stephanie Lichtenstein. She's here, and she's on one of the panels, and I'm sorry, I don't know which one, but if you get a chance to sit in with her, have a listen. She's amazing when it comes to Twitter and to Facebook. So have a listen to what she has to say. Definitely, if you can track down that, uh, that uh, session, by all means do it. She's amazing. Also, if you'd like a copy, I just interviewed her on both of these topics. If you uh, drop a card off, where's Kimberly? If you give a card to Kimberly here, I'll make sure we send you those two interviews. They're an hour long, and she just talks about how to build traffic with Twitter and how to build traffic with uh, Facebook, and she completely blew me away. I had no idea how much opportunity there was uh, with those two. I know, I know, don't get me wrong, I know Twitter's big, I know Facebook's big, but she took it to a whole new level. She completely floored me in those interviews. Of course, once you build your visitors, you want to have strategies to keep them coming back. Because if you're surviving on new traffic all the time, you're probably not going to make it. So you want to make sure you're bringing them back. So we talked about this little email that goes out automatically. You can dress it up. It can look anything, you know, however you want. But you want them coming back. So I use a little service called AWeber. I'm sure many of you have heard of AWeber. And they've got a feature called RSS to email. And you literally take your little RSS feed from your website drop it into a little field at AWeber and fill out the little, the little uh, 
wizard they have, and then next thing you know, every time you add a new post to your website, every time you add a new podcast, automatically it's emailed out to your list. If you're adding lots of content in a week, and that's too many times to go out to your list, you can set it up. So, for example, every Tuesday, 1 o'clock, I want my email list to be uh, sent all of the recent posts from the week before, package it up nicely as a newsletter, and send it out to everybody automatically. And that's what uh, RSS email will do. Number two is podcasting, as we talked about. Great way to keep them coming back. And the reason I've limited it to three, because I think probably these are the only three you really need to keep them coming back. And then be helpful. Be very helpful. It sounds like a simple thing, but uh, if we're really focused on creating content and solving the needs of our visitors and we're really putting together uh, information that's designed to serve them as when they get there and they really like what they see, they probably will keep coming back and that can make a tremendous difference in your businesses. Here's a little, little tip here. You can see there's a little, uh, we, you, you know them as a Gravatar. How many of you heard of Gravatar? How many of you go to a comment form or a form or you see the comments and you see all the little places where people's faces can be? Some will have their photos in there, some will not. I always struggled with this about three years ago to figure out how do I get my face in that little square? It seemed like a simple thing and I've been around for a while and I was just like, it can't be that complicated. And I found the service that does it. It's called Gravatar. So if you go to gravatar.com, and it's free, and you upload your little thumbnail and associate it with your email address. When you next time you fill out a comment on somebody's website, and you, it always asks you for your email. It'll pull your image from Gravatar and it'll propagate that little that little placeholder for you. Now it's in there. If you want to take it to the next level, you can actually hire a little graphic designer to put a little icon together, something like that. And every time now you post uh, in in somebody's uh, comment area, you get a little banner ad set up for you. If you post it in a chat form, you get a little branding going on. You get the website address there. In her case, she's got epilepsymoms.com and a podcast. If you're out on Twitter and you post a tweet, it shows up. If you're on Facebook and you post a, a, a post in Facebook, it shows up. It, you can use these everywhere. And uh, we do, and it's a, a very good strategy to help uh, people to get to know you. And again, you want to get your smiling face on everything. Top three analytic tools. Google Analytics, I'm sure pretty much everybody's heard of that. But learn how to use it. Make sure you take the time to learn how to use it. If you need a tutorial, just go to YouTube, type in Google Analytics tutorial, you get 100 of them at least. And just take some time to learn how to use it. Crazy Egg is another one that's uh, it's, uh, pretty much amazing because if you even just take them, take them up on their free service, what it'll do is it will record a video for you of 400 visitor sessions coming into your site. So you can put it on your, one of your most popular pages or a couple of your most popular pages, and it will actually videotape them in exactly what they're doing. So if they're scrolling past long sections of content that nobody seems to be reading, you've got a problem there. It's got to be sorted out. If they're clicking on things that are not clickable, you can actually see what they're doing on the page. And it's fascinating. Very simple to set up, and they've got a free service where you can do 400 videos a month and then expand it from there. And then, sorry, I got these two confused or mixed up. Clicktail is what we're talking about there, where it will uh, where we'll do it. Crazy Egg is a simpler version of it. It's more of a heat map. And then Clicktail is the one that will actually record the videos for you. Top 10 tips to get your business on track. How are we doing for time? What, what time we got? 235? Okay, great. So 10 tips to get your business on track, if I may. Number one, give yourself some time to succeed. I know sometimes we come into this industry and we're in a hurry. You'd be much better off, in my experience, to slow it down and learn how to do this properly. Go through it and uh, just give yourself a bit of a break and some time to succeed. Number two is build yourself a virtual team. You want I outsource just about everything. We have Kimberly here, she handles our editing, she's also my assistant, and she's got a great website of her own called tikikiki.com, and she works with my wife and I, and she handles most of our writers. We have seven writers that work for us through Elance, and they're amazing writers, but Kimberly's the one that makes sure they're on track. So you want to make sure you build yourself a virtual team. And when I say virtual, I mean they're not going to be your employees, but these are people you can draw on. So in this industry, you're probably going to need a writer, you're going to need somebody who can handle your technical problems. You need a graphic designer. 
You need somebody who can work with WordPress. Can you learn how to do this all yourself? Sure. But it's probably not where you want to spend your time. You want to spend your time building the business, not working in your business so much. You want to be managing and overseeing. And the other thing is it's so inexpensive, you'd be surprised how much you can get done for uh, the price that you're paying. Number three is learn how to do it right. Learn how to outsource. This is one of the things that uh, I actually had a little bit of a leg up with people on the, in the industry is because I came out of the general contracting business, so I was used to hiring electricians and plumbers and tradespeople and HVACs, and I was a carpenter by trade, so I kind of had this idea of building things. Moving into this world, my only challenge in 1999 was there was no subtrades. Everybody was still in the offline world. But then all of a sudden, Elance came along, and if you haven't been to Elance, you should go set up a free account with them today. Uh, all of a sudden, you have this pool of about 1.5 or 1.7 million tradespeople, is how I look at them, writers and techs and uh, graphic designers, people who can set up your WordPress website and help you in every, anything that you can possibly imagine. Accounting, legal, whatever you need uh, is outsourced. 15-minute rule is something I live and die by. If I can't fix it, how many of you struggle with a problem all day long? And you just can't get it sorted out. You've got a technical issue that's a problem, and you can't figure out how to fix it. It seems to be a problem, and you, you know, the next thing you know, half a day is gone. I remember talking with one of our members of our boot camp. His name is uh, Jay Schwa, and he's a pretty good technical guy, but he was struggling with something that he just couldn't figure it out. And he's spent all afternoon on it, and then we had a live Q&A that night. He comes in, we're talking about it with him in the live Q&A. And then he posted it in the chat form, and it's back and forth. And finally, I just asked, Jay, have you tried outsourcing this? No. So go post this at Elance. So he goes and posts it at Elance. He lets me know the next day it costs him $12 to have it fixed. So he'd wasted about eight hours of his own personal time when he, he found somebody who actually was trained in it to, uh, to take care of that form. So the rule is, if I can't fix it in 15 minutes, I take the next 15 minutes to outsource it and then find somebody that can take care of it for you. So... Uh, Number three is learn how to outsource, and number four is the 15-minute uh, rule. Number five, become a student again, and be very careful in this industry and online who you're listening to. Make sure you uh, listen to only the people that have proven success stories. Set goals. I think most of us have been taught this. And then promote, promote, promote. One of the, one of the mistakes people make in, with their websites is they spend all their time working on their website when a good 80 to 85% of their time should be spent promoting their website, not working on their website. Got to get the website up, got to get it put together properly, it's got to have the great content, got to have a strategy to make sure the content's coming in and being updated and refreshed and fresh content and have your writers take care of that. And then what I spend my time doing and what I recommend you spend your time doing is promoting your site. Be the champion of the website. Track and measure, use the tools. Google Analytics is free. Clicktail has a free version. Crazy Egg's got a free version. Track and measure everything. And then work hard and play hard. One of the beautiful things about the industry, we've had an opportunity to travel amazing places. And this is my wife, Arlene, on a little cruise ship. She's not even here today because she's on a five-day train excursion with my son, Adam, our son, Adam, up in the interior of BC. And she kills me when I show up pictures like this, but uh, she really has a good time. And she helps, she handles the help desk. She works really hard at it. She does a really good job. And, uh, but she has fun. And the nice thing about cruise ships is always an internet cafe somewhere that you can pop in and see how things are going. And then number 10, no hocus pocus, just focus. It really is just a matter of getting the work done. The one challenge with the internet is the most distracting place on the planet. It's so easy to go. Next thing you know, three hours are gone and you've completely gone off pace what you were working on. You've got to come back on. So no hocus pocus, just focus. So then, let me just offer you up a few things. I do a series of coffee talk interviews, because of course we can only kind of touch on things. But again, if you give your card to Kimberly, I'll, I'll have Arlene, my wife, send you uh, these six coffee talk interviews. This is Greg Shepard, he owns a major affiliate marketing network, amazing guy. Talk with him for an hour on how to choose a topic. Shlomo owns sterilizers.com. He's a merchant that has an affiliate program. You want to hear it from the merchant side of the equation and get a lot of tips on how to be an affiliate from the merchant side. I'll send you this one. This is from Shlomo. And then uh, evaluating merchants, how to evaluate merchants, uh, where we take you through step by step. Outsourcing, this is our 
audio me teaching you how to outsource. There's no pitch in it, it's just pure information. Online PR, this is PR Web. This is uh, Mario Bonilla, prweb.com, and he talks for an hour about press releases and how to build traffic using their very inexpensive service. And then this is Miles Baker, talks about how to build traffic using the strategies that, uh, that we taught him. And it's been, so if you would just give her your card, we'll be happy to, uh, when we get back, have all, all those audio sent to you, and then you're more than welcome to dig through them. Plus, I'll send you the two new ones with, uh, from Stephanie. All right, so I think we got some time for a Q&A here if uh, we got some questions. And I think, how are we going to handle this, uh, Desiree? Are we doing this with the microphone? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. First off, the Indian people are great, and I hire them for coding, but I don't hire them for writing ever. Once in a while, they'll sneak in, and no matter how hard they try, we always get the grammar problems. Uh, but what I do is I deal directly with the person doing the work. I don't want even in my when I write my work orders, I want an English natural English speaking person only, and I don't want to be dealing through a manager. I want to deal directly with the writer. I want to hire the writer directly or the coder. So if they've got a team, I don't usually work with them. I want to go direct. And if you give Kimberly your card, I'll send you some samples of our work orders, so you can see them. And I find that the real trick with Elance is really being crystal clear on what you want, and then and avoiding mistakes like I used to make was dealing through a manager. And the more clear you can be up front, and that would be one of the things you clarify right up front. I'm not wanting to deal with the manager. I want to deal directly with the person involved. After we've put together a new page, so we've really taken time to put a great page of content together. First thing that I would do is I would, and I am a big Google guy, but that takes some time. But the first thing that I would do is make sure that it's properly linked to from other pages on the website. Because a lot of times you can build an orphan page very uncarefully. So if you've got pages on your site that are also already very popular, maybe have some page rank, and you can find a way to work a link in on a few of those pages to the new page, that'll help a lot. Then, of course, you can build a few, some backlinks to it. And backlinks, Google, we talked earlier, Google determines, uh, Google doesn't rank sites, they rank pages, they rank each page individually. So you want to get backlinks into that page because one of the primary ways Google will determine where that page is going to rank is by not so much analyzing your page because you've got a lot of control over that, although they do look at it. But what they're really looking for is what other pages on the internet are linking to it. And they look at those as a quasi style vote. And the more votes you have, the better that page will rank. And there's more to it than that, and the quality of the vote is everything, so the, the type of page that's linking to it is very important, but that's another thing. Then I would also make sure it's got some social media activity. I try to get my pages to have uh, activity on them these days. Comments coming in, I want to make sure, because if you're just writing pages and nobody's commenting on them, nobody's paying any attention to them, that's a problem. You've got to look at that. I want to make sure it's retweeted. I want to make sure it's liked. I want to make sure it's Google Plus. And so I just, I just basically, in my particular case, if it's a page that I can send out to my newsletter list, let them know this new article's done, I'll bring them back in that way. And basically everything. Just, you know, I would just start with, you know, just focusing on the page. Because a lot of people, again, they just build the page and then they move on to build another page. And they kind of leave these other pages in the back and they don't really do much and they wonder why. Because even just those little strategies will put you ahead of most pages that are being created online because they don't take the time to do anything with them once they're done. Does that answer it? Uh, yeah, no, some might. I mean, for a single time, most of you are just getting started. You're, you're brand new, right? So you don't have an email list. And you have this brand new domain name. So you can do all the back and you walk. You're probably going to be sandboxed for the first few weeks or few months. And you're really not going to be able to increase your page rate. Um, social media, you know, you have a new website, so you've got to start creating mm -hmm. Good question. And, and that's a very good point. It does take time to take a brand new site from nothing to something. And if there, I don't really know a quicker way other than to just really engage it. Go after, you've got to learn how to build backlinks into your site. 
press releases is a quick way to do it, like a, and a very reputable quick way to do it. Stick with PR web, because there's a lot of very unreputable press release companies out there that really are blog networks in disguise. And so you want to stick with the reputable ones. But it takes time. And one of the things that I say is I don't really focus on the money for the first six months of a site. Like it's really about just knuckling down and making sure you're doing the right things, though. And backlinking has got to be one of the top things on your list. And backlinks from reputable websites that are linking to you. And we do it through a method we call PAD. I kind of stumbled upon it in 2004 at the end of the link partnering era. And... PAD is simply a three-letter acronym for professional article distribution where we'll create a very nice, well-written, well-researched article, typically 700 to 1,000 words in length. And within it, there will be a couple of links back to our site, and then we'll work hard to make sure that that article gets published on somebody else's reputable website that has those links back in. So then it's really, and I work with a lot of people that are just kicking off sites, and that's what we do. First thing, one of the first things we go after is 30 PAD articles distributed with a couple links in each article back to the most important pages on our sites, which are typically those reviews we showed you earlier, and then we just focus on that. Okay? Linking from, from where? So the question is, what are the pros and cons of linking to your own page or linking directly to the merchant? I don't usually link directly to the merchant. I usually link them directly to back to my page because I, I like to be the go-between. My page will typically be, uh, it could be a podcast, it could be an article, it could be anything like that, where I get an opportunity to better present the merchant. Because I would think, unless you're going to do it all in the email. So if it's a nice, very well thought through email, I guess then you may want to link directly to the merchant. But if, uh, if not, because a lot of times an email or a, a, uh, an email will be short, it's better, I find better to bring them into a full-on product review where they can actually read in detail all of the benefits and the, you know, the bad things about the product, the good things about the product. So really basically lets you tee them up versus just sending them to the merchant. Unless the merchants, no, I'd still send them to my own site because I want, I want to be able to direct them a little bit on what, what they're going to see. We're very back of the room. No, it's it's a good it's a good question. It's a and it's probably one that's hard to answer because conversion rate is something that we would always be measuring, and in some cases, and every product different and every merchant's different. I hate to sound like a financial advisor here, but it's really it, it would have to look at it. And I think personally, just I have a style of doing it my the way we do it, and we always direct them back to our site and then through to the merchant. And I, I really can't think of times when we actually direct link to the merchant instead of bringing them into our site. I'm sure it would work. I'm sure it would work. I don't know if it would work better because typically they want to hear what you have to say about the product. So if you're saying it in the email, your audience would want to hear what you're saying about it. So if you're going to cover it in the email and then link them through to the merchant, I would sure that would probably be fine. It's just the way we've done it for years is we just, we don't have the big long email. We send them directly to the page on our site that gives them all the detail and then they go off to the merchant from there. But I, I would think both ways would probably be, work. It's just a matter of measuring both of them. Yeah, they're content-driven blogs. So there will typically be a product review website 
where we'll have a page of content that's usually around 1250 to 1500 words in length, where we've really well researched the, the, uh, the actual product itself, and we've got a whole format that we write our reviews, and we cover off all the details that we feel somebody would need to know to make a, make a purchase, and we cover off the good, the bad, the ugly, the pros, the cons, we cover off everything in the review, and then, and in fact, our reviews are, even the pages our reviews are on are designed. We turn the columns off on our reviews so we keep them undistracted completely. So when they land, they get the header, they got the upper menu, and then it's just pure review. And down at the bottom, the only thing they can do is comment or click through to the merchant and make the purchase. So. No, go ahead. Yeah, I know the coupon sites are having a lot of trouble right now because Google's leaning so heavily to, you know, rich content. And uh, the coupon sites, a lot of them are exactly the same. A lot of them are developed in the same theme and the same software that drives them. And a lot of them are even using the same feeds to feed in their content. So Google's very good at moving, removing them from the results. Where at one time they just left them all in there, and they did. It was just a battle for the top. But uh, now they seem to have turfed most of them. So. I, I don't have coupon sites. I've never built coupon sites. I know associates of mine who have. Some still do very well. But I know the new coupon sites are really struggling. And personally, I, I'm a big favor of the rich information sites, the blogs that get into detail and have really good content and thick content, like deep content. What's your take on duplicate content as far as like syndicating a blog post or syndicating a press release? Or good question. I think the whole industry is throwing out the baby with the bathwater when it comes to this thing called duplicate content. Google put a filter together that basically went after the duplicate content. And everybody says, oh, I can never post that, that article on another website. And really, that's not what Google did. Google went after the guys that were developing thin, say-nothing content, and then mass distributing it to article directories that were very poor in, in, in most cases. And they would send them out to two, 300 sites. And next thing you know, you had that one article on two to three hundred, sometimes two to three thousand, sometimes ten thousand plus websites, and all of a sudden you've got that article everywhere. And it wasn't a good article to begin with. So first off, the quality of the content they dealt with, and then the second thing is they dealt with was the uh, the duplication of the content all over the place, and the duplication of the anchor text within the article, the links that's linking back, killed many people. So, but if it's if it's a if it's a good article. And you publish it on a few sites. And as long as you don't get crazy, like my affiliate buzz, I publish it on my own personal site. And we write a six, 700 word description for it. And then I take the same description and I post it on geekcast.fm. Both of those pages rank. There's no problem there. Yep, same everything. Yep, identical. So Google hasn't had a problem with that. So I don't really think Google really has that big a problem with having a quality article in a few places. Uh, I haven't seen any problems with that. It's the it's the the thin content that you know the earlier stuff. What about if you have a, a similar page where you're doing a split test and you have almost similar content and you just change a headline and both of them are on your same uh, different URL, same root URL? Mm -hmm. Do you think Google looks at that and you're using Google Website Optimizer? Well, that's going that's going as an August first, right? Yeah, that's the one I use. Where Google Website Optimizer, what it does is you can take a page of content. That's your best job that you could do. And then when you can duplicate it and make a second version, maybe make one change to the headline. And then using Google Website Optimizer, it will serve up each page one after the other as people come into it. And then they'll measure what they're doing on those pages. So the pages are identical with the exception of a very small change. And they have seemed to have dealt with that. I've never seen any ranking problems running Google Website Optimizer because I think they know exactly what we're doing. We're testing. And it's their tool. Anybody else? Yeah, in YouTube, when you, when you post a video, there's a description field underneath it that you can fill in. So if you put your entire URL with the full HTTP colon forward slash triple W dot com, then that link will show up when you publish that video. 
And you can put it in the bottom of the, that description as well. Yeah, she monetizes that with the book, and she also monetizes that with Google AdSense. And that book has been amazing. That's a little bit of a different style site. She makes a little bit of money on it, not a huge amount. That's more kind of a give back site. That's more, you know, she just had to get that information out. She used to have binders of that stuff from all the work she did with Adam. And it's like, you got to put a site together with that because it was amazing. What specific equipment do you use for podcasting? Sorry? What specific equipment do you use for podcasting? Like microphone or brand? I use a telephone. Yep, I have a nice headset, a nice Sennheiser headset. And then. I do two ways. With affiliate, with affiliate Buzz on Webmaster Radio, they produce it all. So I just have to show up on Skype, and then they record it. But the way I record Coffee Talk is just through a service called AccuConference. And AccuConference is a conference calling company, and they're amazing as well. And they're inexpensive. So it doesn't cost you anything to get an account with them. And what they'll do is they'll give you an 800 number. And it's not like the freeconferencecall.com where it's really low-quality audio. This is really good audio. And then they'll give you an 800 number for you, and uh, you just give that 800 number to your guest, and then you both call in. It says, this call is being recorded. And it's just, hi, welcome to Coffee Talk, and away you go. And then at the end of the call, automatically it's being recorded. Then you just log into the back end of AccuConference, and then your little MP3 recording is sitting there right for you to download. So it's real simple. And then as for cost, if you're interviewing a guest for 30 minutes, it's just 10 cents a minute for each side of the call. So if there's two of you, Thirty three bucks and three bucks six dollars. It's called Accu Conference, A C C U Conference dot com. Great tool, really great tool. Any others? Yes, yeah, and I think that's a good question because a lot of people don't value their time. So you should, and this is why outsourcing, it makes so much sense. And usually people that push back to me on outsourcing have got themselves set at like 10 bucks an hour. You can hire people on the Elance all day for three bucks an hour, 10 bucks an hour, 20 bucks an hour. So if, if you understand the industry you're in and you've got a little bit of a budget, you put yourself at a good price point and you know, whatever that be, $60 an hour, $100 an hour, 250 an hour, whatever it is, you've got to set your benchmark there because then it makes the outsourcing make sense because then you can, I actually argue with my wife about this all the time. It's like, why are you cutting the lawn? Like, seriously, why are you cutting the lawn? You could be taking some time off here and we hire somebody. No, but she wants to cut the lawn. She likes cutting the lawn. Okay, cut the lawn. So, but that's the kind of thing, right? You just got to take the time to figure out what your time is worth. Put a good price on it because you're on the net here. If you're not worth 100 bucks an hour online, you should probably have a look at it. And then just with a little education and figuring this out, you can put yourself ahead of so many people so quickly. And just by knowing this stuff, you, your, your time becomes very, very valuable. And then once you have that, then you can begin to outsource. So as far as you know, return on investment, I always look at that. I always figure out where should I be spending my time. That's one of the biggest things that I try to make sure that I'm focused on stuff that I should be focused on. And I, the reason I like doing things like podcasting is because they've got a long shelf life. Like, you put a good podcast or a good article on the internet, how long is it going to be there? How long is it going to work for you? Could be for many years, could be earning you revenues. That's a good question. This, uh, being at an event like this is a good way to go. It's just go find the people and ask them. Very rarely will you get a no. Um, I, I literally just ask them. In fact, through the hallways here, I'm always asking people. I just ran into Todd Crawford from Impact Radius, who was one of the original employees of C, uh, Commission Junction. I said, and I've known him for years. I was like, Todd, i got to get you on the affiliate buzz. He goes, okay, great, good, good, let's do that. So it's just a matter of asking them, I think. And then once you have a show out there and a few episodes that you can show them, that'll help a lot, too. Okay, so I think we are probably out of time. we got maybe one more question. Oh, it's a business. <laughs> it's a business. It has its moments where it's exciting as can be, and it has its other moments where it's just like, oh, here we go. 
Yeah, I had, I had a week about six weeks ago where everything that I touched broke. Technically, I was just going to shoot myself. It was just like, get me out of here. And then all of a sudden, it kind of went away. I got one little tech problem that po poked his head up today. We're going to deal on tonight. But other than that, there's been nothing for six weeks. So, But it's usually a lot of fun. I love it a lot. All right, everyone, thanks so much, huh?